everybody. I'm Megan, one of the coordinators of ACAN Circular Economy Group, and I'm thrilled to welcome so many people to the second of our nine part circular economy event series. In fact, this is a record breaker. Um, we've had so many people sign up to this event that we had to upgrade our Zoom account. So it's absolutely brilliant to see so, so much interest in this subject. Um, before we get started, some quick house rules. Uh, the meeting is going to be recorded, so please avoid any background noise and microphones will be kept muted. Um, and if you have questions for our speakers, please type your name and your question in the chat box and we'll come to them. Please don't wait till the end of the session to post questions as we're going to have time for the first round of Q&As after Dan, our first speaker. I'm going to start with a very quick introduction to ACAN. Um, ACAN is a network of individuals within architecture and the built environment taking action to address the twin crises of climate and ecological breakdown. We have three overarching aims, decarbonize now, ecological regeneration and cultural transformation. Our growing network is formed around thematic groups, including circular economy, this group, uh, education, embodied carbon, existing buildings, carbon literacy, planning policy, professional standards, and where the wild things aren't. We're an energetic bunch who work together to create change through movement building, campaigning, political lobbying, direct action, public engagement, research, and knowledge sharing. Um, and if you'd like to join any of these groups, please do join our WhatsApp chat or broadcast channel, and we'll be posting links to those in the chat. So please do get involved. So ACAN's uh, Circular Economy Group has been focusing on how circular economy principles can be applied to the UK construction industry specifically, identifying opportunities and exemplars, as well as the many barriers to implementing circularity in the UK context. The number of attendees here today suggests that there are many, like us, who are enthusiastic about the circular but finding it very difficult to implement in the construction projects we're working on. So we found experts from across the industry to dig down into the details of how to incorporate circularity in a meaningful way at each REBA stage from zero to seven, with a final event to develop a proposal for a new stage eight, closing that circle with deconstruction and reuse. Tickets for the next events are available already, so um, do snap one up if you'd like to join. And just to set the context for today's talk, I'm going to um, give a quick reminder of stage one. This is taken from the um, ROBA plan of works. If stage zero has determined that a building project is the best means of achieving the client requirements, the client team begin the briefing process during stage one. The client requirements for the project are considered in more detail in connection with a specific site or sites and the outcome recorded in the project brief, which will contain guidance on project outcomes, sustainability outcomes and quality aspirations. So uh, moving on to today's event. Um, today we're delighted to be joined by Dan Epstein, Epstein, sorry, sustainability director sustainability lead over the Park Royal Mayor's delivery agency. Dan spent 30 years thinking, designing and delivering sustainable development in the UK and overseas, working in large and complex project structures with government and private sector clients to, to deliver sustainable development. Among many significant projects, Dan was head of sustainability for the London 2012 Olympics. Our second speaker, Nick Fishlock, is a project manager in the regeneration team at Brighton and Hove City Council, one of the first local authorities to declare a climate and biodiversity emergency. Nick leads the effort to undertake sustainable construction in new build housing and sits on the council's circular economy working group. Their circular economy route map for the city focuses on the built environment and will, is due to be published imminently. Dan and Nick will be discussing how architects and design teams can work with clients and stakeholders to ensure that circular economy principles are key to projects preparation and brief at REBA stage one. So we're going to aim to keep this session to 50 minutes. Uh, Dan has to leave a little early, so um, after his 15 minute presentation, there'll be a Q&A. Please do put any questions for Dan in the chat during his talk. We'll then do a quick poll, then Nick will do his presentation, after which there'll be another opportunity for questions. We also have an interactive Miro board to which everyone is invited to contribute and to continue the discussion. This is going to form the basis of a resource that we'll produce at the end of the series. So all contributions are very welcome. So we'll post the link in the chat to that now. So that's quite enough from me. I'm delighted to introduce Dan Epstein to, to kick off our stage one discussion. Hi, 
everybody. Um, and thanks, Megan, for that introduction. It makes me sound like a very old man. Um, the, yes, as, as Megan said, I've been kind of involved in, can you see my screen, by the way? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Now? It says it's starting. Yeah, we can see it. Right. Okay. Um, I've been involved in sustainability for a, for a very long time. I'm kind of over 55 and apparently um, <laughs> we only just get a vote. The, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, so I really loved the first talk, actually. I thought Richard and Duncan did a great job. So I'm going to build on that. I'm not going to talk too much about what circularity is. I'll give you a quick introduction, the kind of my perspective, and I'm going to talk to you about how we've been trying to embed it into projects. Um, I guess it's kind of just as a by way of introduction, this has just come out from the um, World Economic Forum, 22.8 billion tonnes of, of annual emissions associated with creating new products and virgin materials can be eliminated by applying circular strategies that drastically reduce the amount of minerals, fossil fuels, metals and biomass consumed by the world's economy. That's 39% of emissions can be addressed through the circular economy. The issue, though, is that it's a wicked problem. It's a really, really difficult problem to solve. Um, and if it wasn't difficult, it would, you know, it would have been done, actually, because there's lots of value to be gained. The other thing I'd like to say is it's an economic agenda, essentially. It's not a, it's not a you know, a, a specifically an architectural problem. It's a kind of, it's a whole economic systemic problem, and it requires systemic change, and that's difficult. It's the consequence, I'd argue, of our success as a species, you know, through the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution, through discovery of fossil fuels, industrial innovation, consumption, and now technology. And the kind of the result is we've had a really rapid and seemingly unconstrained growth, including of cities. It's been unprecedented, which has led to unprecedented resource extraction. And the consequence of that, and it's a real shame, is that there's been a failure whilst we've kind of grown to take responsibility for our environment, you know, this, this small planet that we all live on and rely for our well-being um, and for natural capital. And it's led to waste and pollution. And it's that which we're essentially sort of trying to, to address. But the problem is the economic it is an economic one. Um, and just by way of sort of systems thinking, I thought I'd just quickly, this is a project I did for the Orkney Islands, where we kind of looked very quickly at what well, we looked, we took some time, but we looked at the Orkney Islands. And they kind of, there are two main imports, really interestingly, diesel. So a third of the reason that they import diesel is for tractors. The other third is for, is for um, ferries and another third is for vehicles. Uh, they also import feedstock and fertilizer. When you actually look at the Orkney Islands, they've got a huge amount of farm manure, which could be turned through AD into gas that could drive tractors. They've got surplus wind energy and tidal energy, actually, and they often can't export it, which could be turned into hydrogen that could run the ferries. And then they could use the electricity directly to drive electric vehicles across the, across the area. If you converted and you really need an entrepreneurial spirit, real governance and, and, and drive, you could actually save money, convert the, clean up the economy and deal with a number of other problems. For example, the runoff of waste nutrients into, um, in, into locks, which are then polluting the fisheries, the fish stocks, and they're de therefore damaging their exports. So there's a load of really interesting technology that could be applied, like AD, some really interesting pharmaceutical technologies and uh, in industrial technologies that could be converting a lot of that waste into really valuable export. So that's a kind of an example of systems thinking, understanding the kind of the flows. So at some level, we need to be sort of doing that. Just, you know, from an architectural point of view, it's just fascinating. This was an image of Shanghai in 1980, and then again in um, 2010. So when we talk about the amount of resources that are used in the construction industry, this is a brilliant sort of depiction. You know, the amount of concrete steel, not just in the buildings, but in all of the infrastructures to supply this and then into operate it to run it is sort of vast. And this is happening all over and has been happening, continues to happen all over Asia, all over Africa, not so much in Europe. London's the only city that's really grown, major city in, in, in Europe. But essentially, you can just get a really visceral issue, a picture of what we need to address when we talk about the circular economy. So as I sort of said, there's been runaway um, growth in the use of in the extraction uh, of, of materials and that results in climate impact it results in resource depletion and also in um, degradation of our, of, of our natural system so loss of biodiversity that's been exponential really and particularly around construction um, minerals uh, fossil fuel um, fossil fuels and metals and it's resulted in 
all of this pollution on, in our seas, in our, in our rivers, in our skies, you know, and, and on our land, in our soils. We really have to kind of address that. It's kind of criminal, actually. Waste is a, you know, just bad design. Um, we tend to think about, you know, demolishing and recycling first, then de deconstructing, then repurposing on new, and then uh, refurbishing. And we really need to have a change, a mind shift, a, a design shift and a material shift in the way we go about doing our architecture. I guess what's really interesting, though, is that for Georgian homes, for Victorian homes, for Edwardian homes, actually, we're very used to repairing, retrofitting, improving, enhancing that stock. We just don't do it very much with commercial, non-residential. So it's not as if it's kind of new, uh, but it's also interesting to note that VAT discriminates against re uh, refurbishment and financial systems um, and supports new build. From an architectural point of view, and at this sort of stage, I think there are essentially um, and this is taken from a book I wrote with the GLA, the Pri uh, Circular Economy Primer, which is kind of worth having a look at, you can download. But essentially, from a policy and planning perspective, we really need to be thinking about long life and loose fit and low carbon now. And that's been a, a concept been around for quite a long time, but we've got less, less long life, less loose fit as we get more bespoke. We need to think about design for disassembly. We need to think about the amount of materials and the type of materials we're using. We use far too much material. So much of it's redundant, actually. We, we often, as engineers um, at Expedition Engineering, where I, kind of, where I work, we often reduce the amount of materials by about a third working with architects. We need to be thinking about how we reduce the overall life, uh, the, the overall um, energy use uh, and carbon emissions across the life of the building. That's the sort of passive uh, dimension. And then we need to be thinking about sourcing sustainably. So that's really about local sourcing, secondary use of secondary materials, high value secondary materials particularly, um, but and, and also healthy materials and then certified materials. And then finally, we need to be thinking about construction, demolition um, and excavation waste. We don't do nearly enough about that. Um, but, and also a bugbear of mine is the whole way in which as we get denser in cities, we, we really use, we really think about waste and the whole waste recycling and waste collection process at the very end. And what you're seeing is that in dense multi-occupancy buildings, you know, we're getting recy recycling rates of about 20% because waste isn't really considered. Where do we put it? How do we, how do we sort it? How's it collected? It just ends up in a basement being a mess, having to be, and it, and it becomes a sort of long-term issue. Whereas in houses, in, in semi-detached, in detached terraced houses, you're getting 60, 65% recycling. So we really need to think about that whole process, the technologies, the layout, the architectural uh, design of, of all of that servicing, and, we, and, and, and which tends to be an afterthought. Um, and then from an architectural point of view, maybe more specific from a design perspective, you need to be thinking about how do you use, what, what, what materials we're we using? Can we substitute, for example, concrete for, uh, for wood? Can we be thinking about, um, lighter materials, can we take out uh, some of the materials that we're over specifying? Can we design for adapt adaptability? Can we design for disassembly and can we design for longevity? Again, these are things that we really don't think about deeply or, 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 or well enough. And so what we've done through, we've developed for the, for the GLA a sort of a whole systems approach to embedding circularity is to think about um, the sort of decision-making process that you need to go through, whether you're on a kind of a new build or on a retrofit or a, sorry, or on a retrofit. So from a retrofit perspective, how often are we asked by a client on a big commercial development or in a new retail development, et cetera, just knock down what's there and let's start again. You know, we rarely are asked actually to really look at the building that's there. What can we salvage? Could we reuse it? And we don't go through a sort of a process of properly going in and surveying that building, testing it, looking at how we might adapt it, looking at whether it's fit for the kind of new use. And, 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 and so we end up with, we ought, we ought to be kind of looking at re refurbishing, repurposing as a kind of matter of course. If we can't do that, then we deconstruct and we, and we, and we demolish. So we think we need to be really reinforcing a different way of thinking. And for a new build, we, we split the kind of the build into long-term um, buildings that are over that are, that are designed to be there for more than 60 years. Typically with the foundation, they'll be there for 100, 200 years and short-term buildings. And for long-term buildings, we need to be asking ourselves about longevity, adaptability, flexibility. So in the kind of COVID era, but also in this sort of technological era, as we move away from um, shopping, you know, to 
uh, or, or, you know, in, on, on the high street to shopping online, or we move away from the office to new forms of work. You know, how flexible are, is that commercial space? How, how flexible is that um, and adaptable is that commercial space? And, and you know what, we live in a time of rapid change and, and, and th those, we're likely to have change in all, in all parts of our life. So let's build buildings that really are flexible and adaptable. We rarely ask that. And let's make sure that if we're gonna build them for the long term, that they are also very, that, that they weather well. We use far too many composites that weather really poorly and that longevity is, um, is, 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 is part of a mindset. And if you're gonna build for short term, well, let's build buildings that you can move and reuse somewhere else or that you can take apart and reuse. So there's a whole kind of thought process that should be going into the, the very early stage of a project. The way we try to embed that into projects with a number of design, uh, uh, with a number of development clients, is to think systematically and prioritise around the, the various sort of strategies that belong under the sort of overall heading of circularity. So whether it's designed to minimise resource use, design for longevity, adaptability, disassembly, secondary use of materials, standardisation and modularization, product as a service, or the sharing economy. Let's really kind of investigate what that could mean on your development with the with the developer because they really don't understand most most developers don't really understand this agenda at all and begin to sort of develop a whole sort of series of ideas um, and prioritize those ideas. Once you've gone through that, you can then begin to work with the, the whole design team. So whether it's a structural engineer, the environmental engineer led by the architects, the interior designers, um, etc and go through that sort of list of opportunities around the circular economy and begin to really identify ways in which you can build circularity at the very early stage, at stage one, into this building. Those ideas, you can then work up as individual ideas. So what, are the, what is the idea? What's the concept? What's the opportunity? What are the challenges? What's the mitigation? What's the cost? And what are the benefits? So we argue that you can go typically in a day from generating around 100 ideas to 10 great ideas that you work up and they become a, a, a very clear part of your brief. We think every project can do this. And we've done this with quite a few developers. We do it with quite a few architects. And what you generate typically using these sorts of sheets are loads of ideas from the developer who then suddenly gets the, the whole concept of circularity because you've broken it down into its constituent parts and from the design team. Ideally, you, you go through this process over a week with the design team. So you really kind of investigate the big opportunities. Should we, can we substitute you know, concrete for timber? Could we, um, can we do this as, uh, off-site manufacturing? Could we look at how you know, um, services as a service? Could we rent those rather than buy them, et cetera, et cetera. You generate a huge number of ideas. You kind of begin to really extract the best ideas. You look at how that impacts on the design. And that's really part of, um, for, from a London perspective, developing an outline statement that you need to submit now with your, with your plan. So it's really part of stage one. It drifts into stage two and stage three, but it's essentially the big concept. It's going beyond the concept and it's getting into sort of identifying the opportunities, the strategies that you can develop on your project around circularity. And you can begin to measure those in terms of the amount of recycled local material, the, the weight of your, the embodied carbon and carbon savings, et cetera, for each of those uh, opportunities. And we sort of set out in the London plan and the guidance ways of measuring that in very sort of practical ways. Um, and then that then feeds into the whole project life cycle. So you start off with this formalization of strategies, goals, and, and briefs, and it's, it should feed into your development of solutions, metrics, um, statements, et cetera, and then into, and ideally actually you have your contractor working with you from the beginning, and it kind of then goes into the whole construction process. So some quick examples. We worked um, as expedition engineers with Make on Baker Street. Eleanor were the developers. They wanted this building on your left uh, to be knocked down. We went in with an engineering led approach. We said, actually, we can underpin this building. We can completely strip it out. We can save 70% of the original building and we can give you a building that, um, it, it, that's cheaper and delivered much more quickly. We saved three years on the program, which meant that the, that the developer was earning three years worth of uh, rents and they got a fantastic and award-winning building. Um, and it was really about us going in with a mindset. They hadn't thought about reusing this building and, and, and demonstrating how um, how we could do that. Very similar with Richard Rogers and Expedition. Again, we went and looked at this building in Barcelona, the Barcelona Ballring. It was essentially a um, one-story 
above the ground level. There were banks that, that led up to it. it, was inaccessible, it was run down. We brought the whole building down to the ground um, and redid the public realm by building this big, this, putting in this huge ring beam and new columns that underpinning effectively the whole, the whole building, retaining the facade and then stripping out and redesigning the, in, the interior. It's now a thriving, or oh, it was um, until COVID, a sort of thriving uh, center in Barcelona. On this project, the, we worked with St. Mark's uh, school to build this sports hall. They had very little budget, they needed to do it over the summer, and they really wanted it to be cheap and easy to maintain. So we stripped it right back with the idea of disassembly, cost, efficiency, structural uh, integrity as part of the whole and beauty as a kind of, and, and, and the circularity here sort of defined the aesthetic, if you like, as part of the whole approach. And the, the clients is incredibly happy. They save money, it's easy to maintain, and it's easy to, um, uh, to, to uh, um, and, it, and, it, and it looks great. And it's kind of very versatile. So it kind of really it ticks a load of boxes. But again, it was all about kind of explaining to the uh, client that this is what we were looking for. On the London Olympics, um, Megan said I was the head of sustainability. Here again, um, expedition working this time with Hopkins. You know, when we were going to have a cable, uh, um, we were going to have a portal frame roof. We decided this was the first big stadium like this in the UK to use the, use the cable net roof. We decided to go for the cable net roof. We saved three months in the program. We saved 75% um, of the embodied carbon in the, in the roof. It was much safer and easier to install. Um, and it was also, and it's a kind of fantastic project. Overall, we also reduced the embodied carbon in the concrete by 50% on this building. And, and all of the material in the concrete was used, was came from recycled materials. And then finally, on the Olympics, and um, Zaha did working with Arabs, did a did um, turned. Uh, so for the Olympics, you need seventeen and a half thousand seats. It's a kind of requirement of the International Olympic Committee. After that, the biggest event you'll have is a, is a two thousand seater. So we kind of designed these seats using composite materials with the events industry, so they could be taken away, put in the back of a van and used in events, and they're regularly kind of uh, put, taken down and, and put up. What's interesting as well is we looked at the PVC that was being, that was used on lots of temporary buildings. Yeah, there was a big argument, you work with Greenpeace, not to use PVC. We compared the life cycle analysis of PVC against glass fiber, other, other uh, um, uh, stretch materials like this. This was the best because you can use PVC over and over again, but we also work with the chemical companies to take the phthalates out which are the things that are really nasty and to replace it with phthalate free so we created the phthalate free pvc so innovation and life cycle analysis you know uh, as part of sustainability agenda and then lastly um we went much further than that as well we began to think about how we could use uh, waste wood from around london bring it in by barge and by rail to the energy center to provide biomass uh, heating and cooling for all the buildings we looked at we put a biomembrane reactor into the Olympic Park where we took sewage water, we treated it on site and we used it for irrigation, for toilet flushing and for washing down the area. All the concrete, none of the concrete on the Olympic Park used primary uh, stone, it used secondary aggregates from the China clay industry and we replaced all, most of our virgin cement with, peer, with pulverized fuel ash or GGBS. Uh, from the steel industry. We, re we washed for the first time on a major project, we washed all of the contaminated soil, we recovered 80% of it, we saved ourselves half a billion pounds on that, on that scheme, so the circularity can really sort of save money. Um, and what's more, we didn't have to export and then import loads of materials, so rap massively reduced the amount of um, um, emissions associated with movement of materials. Um, and the congestion. And then we had to take down lots and lots of buildings. We recovered 98% of those build of, of the materials. Often it was kind of downcycled, unfortunately, but we did take whole building, full of frame buildings down and, re and resurrect them elsewhere. So lots achieved as a result of really smart engineers, really smart architects, working with a client that was keen, or in some cases, having to persuade a client, but showing how the client could embrace this, um, agenda in a very practical way um, at the very early stage. And if you don't do it at this sort of stage, stage zero and stage one, you miss the opportunity. Thanks very much. Be intense. <laughs> That's fab. Thanks, Dan. Um, I can see we've got quite a lot of questions that have come in and also some great, um, some great 
sort of conversation going on in the chat. So please do continue that. And um, also please do use the Miro board if you want to um, start to uh, collaborate more on some of these questions and answers. So moving on to some of the questions, I think a key, one thing you just sort of ended on, Dan, was um, that, that question of how you engage clients at that early stage. And I think that is a real key issue for, for architects and others in the built professional to so how do we get those people on side. Um, Christopher Stewart in the chat asked, how will we get beyond any sounding chamber and influence brief makers and clients who contribute to stage one? So I guess it sounds like for lots of your projects, you already have a very invested client. What would you do if you were trying to sort of help shape a brief and help to um, get the client to buy in? Um, I think we, are, we often don't have very invested clients actually, and we often don't have and often our clients don't really, they kind of have a notion, um, but they don't know what to do. So, I mean, I think there's a kind of, you need to bring a narrative, you need to bring a story, you're kind of selling an idea. I think you've got to be quite practical and you've got to kind of demonstrate that that idea is doable. It's not kind of pie in the sky. You've got some practical ways of engaging um, and it can be really sort of exciting. So I think you've got to present it in a way that um, is really, um, yeah, is, is really practical. It's got, you've got to kind of demonstrate this kind of real value in spending a bit of time on that thinking. You may, and sometimes we do, spend that time without charging the, the developer. It could be really want to kind of introduce these ideas and we, you know, and then if we can get them introduced, we can then do the additional kind of, you know, we can do the work, we can get it built into our brief, we can then kind of charge for the work sort of later on. Because it does require often more creative thinking, more work by the, you know, from an our point of view, from the engineer, but I think also by the architect to really kind of go away from standard specifications, you know, that that your suppliers are kind of bringing to you and kind of really thinking from first principles about how your building's kind of working, you know, what the what standards you're working to, you often have to test things. But I think you, you really have to be fairly confident, you have to think it through beforehand, and you have to sell it as a proposition to your to your developer partner. And an appeal just to sort of sorry. So go on. Yeah, basically, I was going to continue from that a question from Keith Van Loen um, to asking asking about why and when are developers invested in in circularity and what are the challenges? So you just talked about helping them to overcome them. Can you identify any key obvious challenges or not so obvious that we should be thinking of when we're trying to get those conversations going? Um. Develop as people in a way, you know, and frankly, some care and some don't. Um, it's difficult. I mean, I think what I, it's the, I think, I think, you know, one, you've got to, you've got to address, I suppose, a big issue is risk. You know, the, there's a kind of, and, and, and cost, time, etc. So I think you've got to, and there is, and that all of those things exist when you're doing, you know, around the circular economy, because we're often trying to do things differently. We're not using the sort of the, the, the approach we used last time. We're trying to use new materials. We're using new ways of putting materials together. We're sort of having to source from different places. We have to use different subcontractors. Um, and it does take a bit more time, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of difficult. In, in a sense, you know, you're not going to be successful with every, with everyone, I, I guess. If, they, if developers, and this is, we are very, we're at the very early stages of this in some ways. If every architect here, and there's a member of sort of, you know, the whole ACAN sort of movement and every engineer is sort of saying, listen guys, you know, listen developer, you've got to think about, you know, the agendas that you've, that you've set out, the carbon agenda, the materials agenda, the circular economy agenda, you know, this is how we do it. And you have a kind of, you know, an approach and you have, a kind of a, a process and you say we can you know we would love the opportunity we really think you need to be thinking about this as part of your brief it may be it's presumptuous but actually you know the architect holds the pen in the end you're much more powerful i think than you than you perhaps imagine you can bring far more into a project than maybe you you sometimes think you can um ideally it's kind of above board but you can also do it surreptitiously um but it's I just think in a sense, you know, you are, you, you, but you do need to kind of position in a way that demonstrates you've thought about risk, you've thought about program, you've thought about buildability, you've thought about the product, 
you convince them. Like, what, a big thing we had on the Olympic part was that um, people thought that circularity or reuse of stone and, and alternatives to cement meant a sort of, a, a, you know, a, a, a downgrade in the quality of the fair face finish on the concrete, for example. So we had to actually kind of invest a bit in demonstrating with um, that, that it didn't have to, that you could actually get really good quality. So there are real issues. Um, and sometimes you might have to build a sort of, you know, a, um, a demo of a, of a wall or of a, of, a, of a, you know, a window, or whatever, you might have to kind of persuade people. It does require a bit more work, but I think that's, that, that's just part of the deal in a way. And maybe we need to go a bit further, but we also need our clients to come with us on that. There's no it's a, a great point to end on that, of, that um, architects do have uh, the power to make change. I know it can feel sometimes like we don't, but I think that's a very good point that actually through demonstrations and through explorations, we actually can help move those conversations forward. Um, I think we'll have to end it there. I just wanted to, there's just been a shout out in the chat about, I think, education. And I just wanted to say that, yeah, ACAN is really focusing on um, efforts to help with education and, and learning about um, uh, carbon literacy. So please do get involved if you want to um, push forward any, any, anything in your own um, universities or your own education, please do get involved. Um, so we're gonna, just before we move on to Nick, oh, and thank you, Dan. I think you may have to leave soon, so thanks very much, but do keep questions coming in for Dan and we'll add them to the Miro board and hopefully we can continue the discussion. Um, just before we move on to Nick, we're just gonna do a quick poll um, and that's to give us a view of who's in our audience and to make sure that these events are answering uh, the things that you're interested in. So if you wouldn't mind just quickly um, going through that and ticking the boxes, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. I hope everyone can see it. Just give it a minute. Bit of interactivity in the middle keep everyone's brains awake. Just um, whilst you're doing that, I, I'm, I'm just looking at the questions. There are some really good questions, you know, so um, I will, will, you know, it'd be quite good if we could kind of pick up on them uh, later. I do Absolutely. have to yeah, and thanks a lot, but um, yeah, I'm very happy to pick up on some of these. See you later. Fantastic, thanks Dan, thank you. Okay, I'm going to um, share my screen. I'll be presenting these slides for uh, Nick. So let me just get those up. Um, hopefully you can see that now. Yeah. And I'll pass over to Nick, the uh, project manager in Brighton and Hove's regeneration team. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, look, yeah, to those questions that we've given to Dan and then the shout out for education, I think those have come into the themes of what I'm going to talk about. About So thanks for inviting me to give the client's view about circular economy in Reba stage one. So with this uh, climate emergency, and, and these are people outside of uh, Hove Town Hall, here in December 2018, a member of the Brighton Hove councillors um, unanimously agreed to review the ways in which the council can tackle global climate change. It declared its recognition of a global climate and biodiversity emergencies, and it pledged to uh, create carbon neutral city by 2030. And then following that declaration, the council is now reviewing its policies and projects and services and how it manages its assets and resources to see how we can meet this aim. And some might say not too fast, but it's a big organisation uh, and I'm really feeling it being a, a lead on sustainability in my area. But also earlier in 2018, the council, uh, Council's Economic Strategy for Brighton and Hope was published and one of its five key aims was a sustainable city. Can we go to the next slide, please? And in this, it, it, it pledged to promote the development of a circular and sustainable economy and to create a circular economy route map. So over this last year, a route map for the city which focuses on the built environment has been developed and it's about to be launched. And all of this is to say that we as an organisation which develops affordable housing and as a construction client, we're committed to building sustainable uh, new homes. But the real question is, is do, do we have the knowledge to do this? 
And for some of our for some of our officers and counselors, do we do we really have a will to to, to meet these really really difficult um, targets? So our housing development program has built 241 new homes, and there's hundreds in the pipeline. Now, Reba Stage One in our affordable housing projects, how do we consider circular economy principles to support reaching the pledge? Uh, we need to agree outcomes for the project brief. But as a client, a year ago, I didn't know what to do. I didn't. I couldn't give our, I could give our aspirations, but how that broke down into specific, specific and measurable targets, I didn't know. At the council, we're, willi we're a willing client, but as a large organisation, we still need to convince many of our officers and councillors that implementing sustainable measures is feasible and delivering new homes on time and budget and which fit with our current management strategy to the rest of our housing stock. So what does sustainable mean and what metrics are suitable? We need to support the client to be able to become carbon literate, to understand the range of factors, including operational energy efficiency, embodied carbon, healthy materials, reuse, and protecting uh, and improving biodiversity. It's a bit of a, that, that's where the education comes on. I think that really supports our, uh, what we're going. Can I have the next slide, please? Thanks. Around the same time, uh, yeah, so these are some of our projects. Just to note on, on these projects we've, uh, uh, that we've delivered so far, we've got, um, um, we, we've got the uh, frames, concrete frames and all that sort of stuff. So we're coming from a place of very traditional build techniques uh, uh, and uh, on these sort of projects. Uh, and it's a real change into the way that, we, uh, that we're looking at things. Can I have the next slide, please? So, Around, in, the, in, in the last year or so, we've had some uh, good guidance that's been published, the REBA Climate Challenge Targets, and given more details, the LETI Climate Emergency Design Guide. Uh, but for, for us as the client, we need some explanation. Do these targets, which, which are given, and uh, uh, maybe a, an architect uh, shows us that these are the way forward, do they go far enough? Is this what truly addresses the, uh, the climate emergency? And what evidence for this and are these targets deliverable on our homes particularly our affordable homes so by being able to explain how these target targets were cho chosen and it is noted in the two documents uh, where they come from but i had to do some more research to get back in and to define the rationale and that it's linked to recommendations from the green construction board that it is supported by government which is great for us as a, a, a as a local authority uh, and it, and if it is taken up industry-wide that it will meet our national climate change targets this extra information uh, uh, and background around it gives us the um the, the support that we need to make these decisions to go with it. So with that information, I can help our staff then to go uh, to understand the reason for the range of targets, where they come from, and explain what they look like in practice. Being able to define what good practice is for new builds, what's actually, actually necessary to meet climate change, and supports a robust argument for choosing these progressive targets. Um, the council since then uh, has now put these outcomes into our circular economy route map. So we'll be embedding the uh, 2030 climate challenge, the, the LETI guides, and the UK Green Building Council's UK GDC hierarchy for, um, uh, for circular economy intervention. And these are going to be on all council commercial developments from 2022. So being able to understand where that is and why that is the target that we need allows us to choose where, where, to, where we need to go. And at stage one, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And at stage one, we need to talk about, uh, talk to the client about and unpack how the targets translate into practice. So while reviewing the site information, the surveys, preparing the project roles and uh, considering the brief uh, for the whole life of the buildings. Um, it, in the first part of this series, we had Duncan Baker Brown outlining the argument for protecting our planet and Richard Boyd, who um, gave some great examples for the economic arguments uh, for using circular principles. And for the council, another key consideration is the opportunities in circular design to support low income households, um, uh, out of fuel poverty out, uh, um, and, uh, and growing food and other sorts of things that can support somebody on a low income and to develop and enhance the new communities that they're moving into and the surrounding community to, to live more sustainably. 
and to and to live together better. But a key document, which is up on the slide here, it, it, to share and discuss at this stage is uh, UK GBC Circular Economy Guidance for Construction Clients. It's really accessible and it's aimed at clients and in particular this document has helped us improve our understanding and helped to support our arguments for those of us who aren't specialists. Um, we've used it to challenge the perceived risks that, 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 uh, um, that we'll have with later sustainable strategies and uh, to link into case studies and it's helped um, inform our specification for, for contractors at late, later stages. So it's helped define for us which circular economy principles to uh, apply to each of our projects. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, getting a better understanding of the client's requirements at this stage, uh, we, we can then identify which circular strategies are, are going to be most in, uh, uh, suitable. This is a recent, uh, uh, this is a little abstract, and I know it might be hard to read, um, uh, for, from a recent stage one um, uh, report that we did. And it goes through the, the main, main issues around here, at, at what we're looking for, energy efficiency, biodiversity net gain and, uh, and carbon footprint and waste, which is around a lot around materials use. Um, but it's, it's very wide ranging and it's not particularly uh, uh, project specific. And as we learn more about this and we get even better, uh, that there are other things that we, we, we can start conversations now, which will support us as a client to, to um, wish to uh, wish to move forward with these sustainable strategies, but and then also to to lay out the strategies as they go forward. So as a developer of affordable homes to let, we need our homes to have robust finishes. We need them to we need to minimize maintenance for heating and hot water and other systems. We also uh, focused on our tenants, reducing fuel poverty and considering future adaptations as resident circumstances change. So for example, their mobility, we want to avoid waste in widening doors as, uh, uh, as people need wheelchairs and things like that, or, or taking out bathtubs if people can't do that. And because we own and let the properties, we, we, we need to think about that very long-term. Um, so this is overall a case to build for longevity within that a bit of adaptability. Um, we're also looking to the future and changes in planning and building control policy. We want to avoid the need to retrofit and, and, and improve these at a later date. Although the outcomes we're choosing are currently way above the proposed, uh, those proposed in recent consultations, we still want to avoid where, the possible, uh, where, where possible the inevitable updates uh, are going to be in the future. But on some sites, we're also building community spaces. And so I'm just checking where I am on the slides. Yeah, uh, um, next slide, please. And on some sites, uh, we're, we're also um, building community spaces, which we know will have many different uses in the future. And we want to avoid the underuse of these assets as some of our current buildings are. And to avoid the costly wasteful retrofits for, uh, for ourselves or for the services such as charities and community groups that use them. So we need to set out a strategy for adaptability, thinking uh, whether these spaces can be changed into offices, co-working spaces or residential later, and it's an opportunity for a circular practice to inform us as the client how by separating and fixing elements in a different way they can be moved or reused elsewhere and designing with alterations in mind uh, with, and designing with alterations in mind with uh, reduced materials waste and, uh, uh, and future costs. And this, th these extracts here are from the, uh, um, from the, um, it, the UK GBC's circular economy guidance for, um, uh, for, for contractors. So it, you can just see an idea out here where, where, it's, where it's coming, where, where the bits are, are fitting. Can I have the next page, please? So another consideration uh, uh, for us is the end user. Is it a private owner in which, in which case they're likely to be invested in how to use their energy efficient home to, a less, uh, to its best ability, whereas a rental tenant may not or, or most likely will not? Um, I'm going to assume that uh, some of our tenants will struggle with new heating systems, uh, managing their heat through shading and opening windows in, in, in high efficiency, 
high, highly efficient building and potentially making their own changes to the property. I've seen drilling into walls and ceilings and floors that will um, uh, make thermal bridges and reduce uh, 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 efficiency all over the place. And identifying these aspects and making a plan to re, uh, revisit through the later stages helps us to be more comfortable with the perceived risks uh, for using uh, sustainable strategies. Here's, uh, here's also thinking of the end users and their uh, engagement with the design ethos. A private owner may understand and appreciate the robust and long lasting finishes and design for better access for maintenance as shown with this um, this wood panelled uh, wall with the uh, with, with the um, with, with the fixtures on the outside, so that they can be uh, taken apart, moved, or, 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 or accessed, which is excellent. But a uh, tenant, a tenant of ours, would expect a finish that's more current, standard, or what they call a normal home with paint and enclosed finishes. So it's. It's going down the wrong path to, uh, uh, to be looking at a strat strategies that take us away uh, from, from what we know we need in our client group. Uh, uh, and so there's, uh, it's better to invest uh, uh, some effort in understanding this up front and progressing the circular opportunities that uh, allow for an efficient design process. We also like opportunities to identify social benefits for those uh, using new bin, new buildings, designing to develop a sharing economy, such as tool shares and food growing, which in our case will support our tenants to reduce their living costs and to form bonds in newly formed community. And these opportunities give us as the client confidence and inspiration and helps generate the discussions about the wider circle opportunities. Can I have the next screen, please? So when getting surveys back, it's, um, it's an opportunity to explain the benefits of taking a circular approach to addressing the constraints of the site. And for us, this often includes existing buildings. Uh, many of our council owned sites considered for housing development have single story office or community buildings built in the 50s and 60s and, uh, and which we can effectively reuse or extend as well as meeting our objectives to deliver enough on our housing sites. And I wish I had more time to talk about going back to stage zero and how we, uh, and what, what we would do as a, as a client, how we manage that. But it's only the last, over the last year that we've really understood these buildings to be a source of materials. And at stage one, we can introduce, or uh, the architect can introduce the idea of surveying the current building for its reclaimable materials and incorporating these into the design. I had hoped to undertake a project uh, on this site actually with uh, Duncan Breaker Brown and the University of Brighton to disassemble one of these buildings and, uh, and use as part of the project to reconstruct with teams of students, designers and artists from across Europe. But sadly, due to COVID, we've not been able to. And this one in inventive use of the, a building, we'd hope to learn about how we survey buildings and, and uh, for uh, deconstruction from this. So we're not there yet in terms of, the, uh, of how we survey buildings, but there's, there, there's some interesting information on lessons learned by uh, European public sector organisations around deep construction strategies on the sustainable procurement uh, uh, platform as part of the Big Buyers Initiative. Check out- um, Nick, I'm really sorry to, inter to interrupt, but I think we're going to have to wrap it up pretty oh, soon. Oh, I'm sorry. We're, over time. I, I'm, we're going too far. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm sorry I've gone too fast, but uh, just to say that looking at the wider picture and these issues where we go, um, through the circular economy route map uh, and its focus on the built environment, we're, we're aiming to use our different roles in the city as a procurer, leader uh, and owner of land and property uh, to develop an online space for information and circular opportunities that we can uh, show how business models can support circular economy and to foster with universities development of new materials uh, and enterprises. Uh, we aim to develop solution manuals for, for retrofit maintenance and plan works and create alternative multi, uh, uh, materials lists, um, create the library of case studies to bring these opportunities to life. And then we will help facilitate resource management in the city. So working on solutions to store and, uh, and uh, reusable ma uh, uh, materials and set goals for um, uh, what we are going to recover at the end of the life. Uh, we're also going to look at developing our planning, planning policy around circular principles and, de uh, and develop a training programme for planners and developers in the cities and agents to try and uh, support these decisions at this stage. 
That's great. Thank you so much, Nick. I think that was a really interesting uh, viewpoint, especially I think it's really good to see local authorities taking the lead and also having such a holistic view on, on the importance of circularity in terms of um, protecting and supporting the lives of, of residents. Um, there were a few questions in the chat, but I think as we're now over time, I might just suggest that we put those questions into the Miro board and invite Nick and Dan to go to the Miro board and answer those questions. Or of course, others are more than welcome to um, jump in and contribute. Um, I just wanna wrap up um, quickly uh, by letting everybody know about a few other ACAN events we've got coming up. The first one is, well actually not the first one, the first one I'm going to speak about is our next, uh, the next one in this series which is Reba Stage 2. That will be lunchtime on Thursday um, in two weeks time with David Cheshire and Salma Zavari. Um, we'd also like to warmly invite everybody to ACAN's Embodied Carbon campaign launch which will be happening at 7pm on Wednesday the 3rd of February. We'll post links to both those events in the chat and we'll send out details in the follow-up email. We do hope you can join us. It's going to be a really exciting and important campaign. Um, and once again, of course, everyone is welcome to get involved. Please join our circular economy group and WhatsApp in our WhatsApp group. Um, and also there are other links. We've just heard that they are, we think they may be oversubscribed. So we're going to look into that and make sure that everybody can join. So please do bear with us while we um, figure that out. Um, and then finally, a huge thank you to Dan, Nick, and the ACAN team behind the scenes and all the attendees. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you have a really great afternoon. And I'm really sorry we didn't get to answer all of those great questions, but we will um, be coming back to those. So thanks very much, everybody. <laughs>